Over the course of many centuries, God made himself known, in particular to the people of Israel. And as he made himself known, there were some hints. He always insisted that he was one God and there was none like him. But already in the first chapter of the Bible, there were the words, let us make man in our own image. There was kind of a hint of plurality and yet always insisting that there was one God in the blessing that God told the priests to put on the people. They were to say, Yahweh or the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. For some reason, the Lord was repeated three times that one great name that means I am. And in a vision of Isaiah, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and the seraphim, the heavenly beings were hiding their faces, they would cry out, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. They would cry out three times holy for some reason. But those things um, really remained a mystery. There was belief in one God and some hints. And then there came into the world a man who claimed to be the Son of God, who claimed to be equal with God his Father. And after he came, he promised that another like him would be sent, and this one would live in them. And it was in that event the appearing of a man claiming to be God, and then the sending of someone else to live in God's people, that people began to think really hard, what does this mean about who God is? And Jesus himself teaches a great deal about the Father himself and the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 16, and I just want to highlight a few of the verses where he speaks of Father, Son, and Spirit. He said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another paraclete, counselor, helper, comforter, to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The paraclete whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So you see there is the Father and Jesus himself and then the paraclete, the comforter, who he's going to send. When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father or proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. The Spirit will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. And with those and many other teachings of Jesus, we see the unveiling of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you read through the Gospel of John, that's very prominent. When you read the letters of Paul, you again and again have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet there is the insistence throughout the Old and New Testaments that there is but one God. And that has uh, spurred on some people to try to make things more understandable and to say what the Trinity is like, and to try to solve intellectual puzzles. Some will say, well, it's, the Trinity is kind of like H2O, where you have ice and steam rising, perhaps, from it, and liquid water. It's all H2O, but it takes three different forms. Or they'll say the Trinity is kind of like an egg. You've got an egg and a yolk and a shell, three different components, but one egg. Or a shamrock, a three-leaf clover. There's three leaves, but they're joined together in one clover. Or the Nile River. It has a source, a channel, and a delta, but it's all one river. Now, sometimes illustrations like that can give you at least a little bit of a hint if you don't extend them very far. But they can also just kind of lead you into, well, heresy. Um, because... H2O is not ice when it's liquid, and it's um, not steam when it's liquid, 
And so it seems to just have different phases. And that was a heresy known as modalism, that God operates in different forms or phases, but not as three distinct persons. The problem with the egg or the clover leaf is that they're different components, but God is not three different chunks where you add them up and you get one God. All of God is in each of the three persons, not a little chunk of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, each is entirely God. And um, the Nile is a decent illustration so insofar as it goes, but the Delta isn't the source and, and isn't the channel. And so each of these has its problems in trying to explain to you how God can be three and be one at the same time. But perhaps the main problem isn't that if you followed these as a hint and went too far with it, you'd land yourself in a heresy. That is, that is a problem. But an equal problem is this. Have you ever wanted to worship an egg? Have you ever said, oh, great three-leaf clover, or bowed down to the Nile, or were awestruck that, that an iceberg was so kind and so loving? The difficulty with these, ultimately, is that each of them is completely impersonal and does not really lead to awe or wonder at who God is. You say, oh, he's like that, um, and you've made it nice and simple, but you've shown nothing about the real being of God, and in particular, the wonder of God, the love of God, the unending delight and joy of God in being God. It's better to just look at God the way the Bible shows him and unfolds also the reality of the Trinity. We came to know of the Trinity because of the missions of God, the two great missions. The entire Bible can be summarized by saying, God sends the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father sends the Son and the Holy Spirit. And those sendings, the Latin word mission just comes from sendings, those two sendings are the basis of our understanding of who God is. The Father sends His only begotten Son to become human, and the Spirit anointed Jesus for mission. And then there is the Spirit who is sent to indwell us. The Father and the Son send the Spirit to apply the Son's work and to live within us. It's because God did those things, those missions of the Father sending the Son and then the Spirit, that we even think about the Trinity at all. So it might be better, best to just leave the eggs for breakfast time and focus on what God actually did and what he says in the Bible. One of the great events in the Bible that really helps us to see Father, Son, and Spirit is the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember that story, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, and as Jesus comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends on him visibly in the form of a dove, and a voice comes from heaven, the voice of God the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, with him I am well pleased. And in that great moment, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Scott Swain, a, a scholar who teaches about the Trinity, says in Jesus' baptism, the Father publicly crowns His only begotten Son. The Son is crowned, and the Spirit is the crown. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. But then we also think about our own baptism. And our own baptism is in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Notice that it is the name not the names. Hashem, the name in the Old Testament was I am, Yahweh. When you are baptized in the name, you are baptized in Hashem, the, the name of God, except the name of God turns out to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the God who is the great I am. And that though it may leave you scratching your head still with some questions, is more likely to bring you to your knees in awe and wonder than an iceberg or an egg. Now when we think of how God revealed himself in the New Testament, we do reflect again on the fact that he did hint in the Old Testament of that threefold nature of his, let us make man and holy, holy, 
holy in the New Testament. You have a vision in the book of Revelation that is somewhat like the vision of Isaiah. And there again, the angels are crying, holy, holy, holy. But this time, the vision shows someone sitting on a throne. And then it shifts a bit, and there's a lamb sitting in the middle of the throne. And before that throne, there are seven lamps blazing, which is the sevenfold Spirit of God. And at the very end of the book of Revelation, you have the river of the water of life flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. What is that river? Well, the Bible says that that river is the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised that out of those who believe in Him would flow rivers of living water. And in that picture, the river of the Holy Spirit flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The theologians describe that as proceeding. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And so when we think about God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we need to think about Him along biblical lines and then with the help of Christians who have thought about very thoroughly throughout the centuries and looked at the Bible, we can get a better understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity and not only try to get a puzzle solved in our minds, but more importantly, to treasure God for who He is, to treasure the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want to look at this from three different angles. One is to simply think about the eternal being of God, who He is in Himself, apart from the world, apart from anything else He does in relation to the world, who God is in Himself as an eternal being. And then to see how that eternal being carries out his mighty works in a triune way. And then what that involves for us in relating to him and how we can treasure the Trinity in our own lives and in our own walk with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God in his eternal being can be described as one God in three persons. The Athanasian Creed says we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. So you don't just mix the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together and turn it into just one person. Nor do you divide the Trinity and chop up the being into three different beings. So neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father, the Creed says, is a distinct person. The person of the Son is a distinct person. The person of the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. But the divinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. That is the great statement of God in three persons. And then that creed, the Athanasian Creed, goes on to say, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet there are not three gods, there is but one God. The Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, yet there are not three lords, there is but one Lord. Just as Christian faith teaches us to acknowledge each person individually as God and Lord, so it forbids us to say there are three gods or three lords. So that is the, one of the classic statements of the Christian faith of the Trinity, three persons one God. The three persons are distinct, and yet the being is one. Now, what do, we, what do we understand when we learn about these distinct persons? That can get a little bit confusing, because in our experience, the word person refers to humans. And when you know one human, you know one person. And when you know a different one, that's just a whole different being. But in the being of God, different persons exist in one being, distinct persons in one being. Now, one reason why we can't conceive of three persons in one being, if we're thinking in just human terms, is that we're bodily. And my body is separate from your body, is separate from another person's body. And as bodily beings, we are separated by our bodiness. God is spirit. And so there's not a physical separation. 
God is also united in being in such a manner that God's mind is one and God's will is one. In the Trinity, you do not have three separate minds thinking totally separate thoughts. You don't have three separate wills wanting three different kinds of things. You have one mind and one will in distinct persons. Now, that is a very difficult, it's a very impossible thing to completely understand. You understand as much as you can, and then beyond that, you adore. But you do not want to stop short of understanding as much as you can either. And when we think of the distinct persons, the persons of the Trinity are different than human persons in not being physical, not having separate mind, or having separate will. But don't just focus on what the persons are not. Think also about what each distinct person is. Each distinct person is entirely God, not a little chunk of God, but entirely God. There is a great division you can think about. There is God, and then there are all created things. Father, Son, and Spirit are on the God side of that divide. There is nothing in God himself that is created or made. Everything about God is eternal, entirely present, and equally God. The Athanasian Creed says nothing in this trinity is before or after. Nothing is greater or lesser. Each of the divine persons is equal in glory. So you do not have separation, you don't have inequality, but what you do have is limitless life and love and delight and glory. God is love. And God is love apart from ever making a world. God is love apart from ever showing love toward any one of us. God is love because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the life of God, the Father loves the Son completely, the Son loves the Father completely, and the Holy Spirit is the bond of their love. Now, in the early church, um, in about 200s and 300s, there arose a heresy. One of the main spokesmen for it was a person named Arius. And he said that the Son was created, that there was a time when the Son didn't exist. And that had a major problem, of course, and we would focus on the fact that, well, he's denying that Jesus is God. And he, he was. But you know what else he's denying? If Jesus is not the divine Son, then God is not Father. And Arius accordingly called him the unoriginated. That's about as easy to worship as an iceberg. He called him the unoriginated. And, of course, he was unoriginated. Nobody created the Father. He, he has always existed. But Athanasius, a great champion of the Trinity, complained very loudly that he would call him unoriginated instead of Father because he has eternally been the Father of the Son, always pouring forth his being in giving being to the Son, always giving love and receiving back from the Son. When you think of God as Father, Earthly fathers do at least a couple of things. One is they give life. They beget life. Another is that they give love, at least if they're half decent. Now, our Heavenly Father is supremely beyond all earthly fathers, but He does do those two things at the very least. He constantly gives life in the eternal begetting of the Son, and He constantly loves the Son with a complete and total love. And so we don't refer to him as the unoriginated. By, that, by the way, that's why you also have to be aware of teachings of Islam and of Jehovah's Witnesses and of, of Jewish people who believe in one God but not in Jesus. What that always involves is that God is not eternally the Father because he did not have a son eternally. And so if he's to be a father at all, he has to start being something he wasn't. And that's impossible in God. God can't start being something he's never been. And the whole view you get of God is different. When you say, oh, we all believe in the same God. I hope not. At least I hope you don't. I hope you don't believe that there is just 
a God alone out there, the unoriginated, the all-powerful and dominating, who was not Father from all eternity, who was not love from all eternity. The Christian faith teaches that God is love. Not just that he started being love at some point in time, but that he is. Because in his very being, he's love. And when we think about God the Son, he is of God. He is begotten of God. The Nicene Creed says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things invisible, visible and invisible. And then it says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, begotten of the Father before all worlds. That means begotten from eternity. That means that he never started being begotten. That means he's always constantly being given his being from the Father. The Father is constantly pouring forth his own being, and what that being is, is his Son reflected back to him. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. Um, he is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one substance, one being, one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made. And that was what the fathers at the, Nice at the Council of Nicaea said about Jesus. He is begotten, not made. Now what does it mean to be made? As I said, to be made is to be on the creation side of things. You had a beginning. To be begotten eternally is to not be on the creation side of things. He is begotten, he is produced by the life of the Father, and the only thing the Father can father is himself. He can only father his own being. And in fathering his own being into another divine person, he has a son who is exactly like him. Now, we human fathers, we, we have kids, but they're not exactly like us. At least I hope most of you haven't done cloning. And even with cloning, you're, the upbringing and all that is different. Fatherhood on earth is just different. You can only contribute half of your genes and a part of your upbringing to help form a child. When God begets, he begets exactly his own being. And so when God begets a son, the son is the essence, the being of the father himself. And then when we think about the life and love, we reflect again the fact that they have an undivided essence. And the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And as I've said already, it's, it's hard to describe, impossible almost to conceive. But the Bible pictures the father ever, forever, not without beginning, not with any beginning, pouring forth the life of his son and the father and the son loving and enjoying and delighting in one another. And somehow their very delight, their very love, their very bond is a third person. The bond of the love of father and son, the bond of their being is the Holy Spirit. And so when we think of the Holy Spirit, he is himself the love that unites Father and Son, and is himself a person. You say, well, how in the world could that be? I don't know. If you think it's totally ridiculous that the love of two persons could ever produce a third, what are you doing with kids? You know, at the human level, the love of two bodily persons actually can produce a third person who isn't identical in being to the other two. But in the being of God, the eternal love of the two persons is itself a person. Now that's about as far as we can go in saying things about the eternal being of God as three persons. But it, one thing you need to know is that each of the persons is fully God, that there, there is limitless life and love and delight and glory, and that there are three distinct persons loving one another in the life of the Trinity. The other important thing that is said, of course, is that you don't turn that into three gods and three different lords and three different beings. The essence, the being, the substance of God is undivided. And oftentimes you'll read in the Bible that God is one. Now, that means at least two different things. The fact that God is one, usually what comes to mind right away is, and that means that nobody else is. And of course that's correct. All of the other supernatural beings or made-up statues that people have ever worshipped were not God. 
God is one, and there is no other. So he is a single God. But there is another sense in which God is one, and that is that he is simple. You say, boy, what you've just been talking about doesn't sound very simple. But what theologians mean by simple is that God isn't chunks and parts. That God is completely united in who he is. Everything that God is, is simply who he is. We can speak of God being loving or being holy or expressing wrath towards sin or this or that. There are various attributes of God by which we attempt to describe who he is and how he relates to us. But in the very being of God himself, we should not think that God is 14 different chunks of stuff, a chunk of holiness, 30% holiness, um, 33% love, you know, 20% righteousness, you know, 5% wrath, you know, and so on. You do not have bits and pieces or components in God. God is one being, undivided, completely united. So to say there is one God means that nobody else is. It also means that God is not divided up into parts. And how are the three persons of God distinct? The classic answer that the church has given to that after much, much reflection on the Bible is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct only in relations of origins. Now, what's meant by relations of origins? Well, if we were to look at the, the Athanasian Creed, it says the Father is neither made nor begotten from anyone. The Son is neither made nor created. He is begotten from the Father alone. The Spirit is neither made nor created nor begotten. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's the classic statement of the eternal relations of origin. So when you think about relations of origin, there are three relations of origin. The Father is distinguished by the fact that he has eternal paternity, fatherhood. He does not come from anybody or anything else. He is the source of all else that is in the being of God. The Father is the one who begets the eternal Son. It is his being that he pours forth, and then that relates back to him in the person of the Son. So his eternal paternity is what distinguishes him from the Son and the Spirit. Eternal generation or eternal begetting is what distinguishes the Son. The Son is forever begotten by his beloved Father. And then the Holy Spirit, eternal spiration or breathing forth. The word spirit means breath. Uh, eternal spiration, the spirit is forever breathed out or proceeds from Father and Son. These are the only things in classic Christian theology that distinguish Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You cannot say, uh, well, the Father is superior to the Son and the Spirit. He begets the Son, and breathes out the Spirit, but he is not superior to them because of that. There have been ideas that one person of the Trinity is subordinate to another. Sometimes even in evangelical Christian circles, there can be talk of eternal functional subordination, where the Father um, is always bossing and the Son is always obeying uh, because there is a superior subordinate relationship. Now we know that when the Son became a human on our earth, he related to the Father in that way because that's how humans ought to relate to God the Father. And of course, in the Trinity itself, the Son is always doing the will of the Father, but not as a subordinate, not as a lesser. Nothing in this Trinity, says the Athanasian Creed, is before or after. Nothing is greater or lesser. It wants you to understand that the eternal relations of origin are the only distinction in the person of the Trinity, not this one's greater than that one or lesser than that one. So when we think about God in his eternal being, we believe in one God, three persons with complete equality, distinguished only by the fact that the Father begets the Son and that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now when we think about not just God's eternal being, but his mighty works, then we see the, the Trinity at work. And when you read the New Testament, you'll find, again, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you'll find the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit at work in creation, in salvation, 
in our indwelling, our sanctification, our glorification. And sometimes we tend to associate those works with different persons of the Trinity, the Father with creation, the Son with salvation, the Holy Spirit with indwelling. And it's not a terrible thing to do that. In a moment, we'll talk about appropriations. That's the word the theologians use to say why you get to do that, to speak of God as God the Father as creator, the Son as the Savior, the Holy Spirit as the indweller. But whenever you do say it that way, remember that you're not saying the whole truth. The whole truth is, first of all, that the Trinity works through inseparable operations. What one person of the Trinity does, the whole Trinity does. There is no work of God that just one person of the Trinity is involved in. The work of creation is commonly associated with God the Father, but read your Genesis. God was there, and what did he do? He spoke a word, and there was a spirit hovering over the face of the deep. And that word, the New Testament tells us, was with God, and that word was God, and through him all things were made. If you read John 1, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, all three of those passages speak of everything being created by the Father through Jesus Christ. And the power of the Holy Spirit is the effective power that God uses to bring life into the world. So the work of creation is an inseparable operation that involves Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you think about the incarnation of Jesus Christ, about Jesus becoming human, you say, well, Certainly, the Son of God is the one who did that, and so it is. The Son is the one who took on a human nature. But did he do that on his own? The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his Son. He sent his Son into the world. And how did he send him? Well, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made human. And so even that incarnation... The Son becoming a human was accomplished not just by the Son, but by the Father and by the Holy Spirit. When we think about the fact that God atoned for us, we say, well, surely Jesus, the Son, did that. And certainly he is the one who offered his life on the cross. But what does Hebrews 9, verse 14 say? It speaks of the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. There you have it. The atonement is that Jesus' blood was offered through the Holy Spirit to God the Father. And so again, that, that a work of atonement on the cross is actually inseparable operations by all three persons of the Trinity, not just the work of Jesus, but of his Father and of the Holy Spirit as well. When you think of indwelling, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. But is it only the Holy Spirit then? Well, what did Jesus say? We've been studying that in John 14 through 16. He said, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. When the Holy Spirit comes to make his home with you, you've also got fellowship with the Son and with Jesus Christ. So, whether it's the indwelling and the making us holy, whether it's the atonement, whether it's the incarnation, whether it's the creation, I could go on and on, but the point is that all the acts of God, all the mighty works of God are inseparable operations. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each and all are involved in everything that God does. And in that, there is an order of operations. When we think about the order of operations, then we find out that God's external works are patterned in some ways on his internal, eternal being. Because in God's works, they follow the same pattern. They proceed from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. And then when you come into relationship with him, the Holy Spirit touches you, you get to know the Son, and you come to know God as your Father. So there is this order of operations uh, the Greek word, if you like it, is taxis, but order of operations. God does things in a certain order that reflect the eternal relations of origin. The Father originates, it comes by the Son, 
and then through the power and application of the Holy Spirit. The Father acts from no one, and he acts through the Son, and by the Spirit. The Son acts from the Father, and by the Spirit, and the Spirit acts from the Father and the Son. And so you have the fact that you have inseparable operations, but there's also a pattern. There's a pattern from the Father, through or by the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. And you'll find when you look at God's actions throughout the New Testament that they follow that pattern. And then there is that matter of appropriation. Sometimes, in an appropriate way, um, a particular work is appropriated to a particular person of the Trinity where he stands in the foreground. So the Father is often spoken of as the Creator, even though the Son and the Spirit are involved in creation. Jesus is often spoken of as the Savior, even though God the Father is our great God and Savior, and the Holy Spirit it comes and nobody is saved apart from the Holy Spirit. But nonetheless, we call Jesus Savior, and the Holy Spirit is often called the Sanctifier or the Indweller and the Comforter, even though it is, of course, the Father and the Son who are working through the Spirit. And so God does that, and, and the Bible often speaks that. Again, I'm not just giving you fancy theological terms. If you think, oh, I'm just, I could do without the theological lecture, one of the things that helps is if we get some of these ideas in our mind, they will help us to make sense of many of the Bible passages we read and to fit them together and to have a unified understanding of what God's word reveals about the one true God rather than have just scattershot fragments here and there, a snatch of this and a snatch of that. But in God's mighty works of creation, salvation, indwelling, everything that God does, the operations are inseparable, they are ordered according to who God is. He shows something of himself by the way he does his works. That's the interesting thing about God's works of salvation in particular. If he just wanted to pluck us out of sin and get us off the hook for something, perhaps there were other ways he could have taken than the one he did take. I don't know. But the one he did take was done in such a manner that he not only gave us what we needed, but he showed us himself, and he gave us himself. He wanted us, in his actions, to know him in his being. And so, in appropriation, the Father gets attention at a certain point, the Son gets attention at another point, the Spirit attention at another point, but let's never forget that always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are doing all those mighty works as one. And that leads us to just think about this amazing fact that the, God is the gospel. The Trinity is the gospel. You lose the Trinity, you lose the gospel. Because it is God who sent his Son to be our Savior. It is God the Father and Son who send the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts. Those are the blessed truths that we rejoice in. And Fred uh, Sanders is perhaps the greatest evangelical theologian of the Trinity today. Here's just a couple of statements that he makes. The Father sends the Son and the Holy Spirit would be a summary of the entire Bible. Salvation history not only shows what God does, but who God is. When you read the history of salvation through the Old and New Testament, you're finding out what God does, but in the process you're finding out who He is as Trinity. God put Himself in the Gospel. That is a glorious statement, that God put Himself in the Gospel that God gives himself to us in the gospel. Not just goodies, not just rescue, himself, all of himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so Sanders says, God's self-revelation is not charades, but show and tell. Now what he meant by that is God did not just send his Son into the world and then send his Spirit into the world and tell us to figure it out. Because, you know, if Jesus had gone and gone to the cross and risen and gone back to heaven and then the Holy Spirit came into people's hearts, you know, they'd, they'd think something really quite amazing had happened. But God didn't just show or do those things. He explained them. That's one of the reasons why we're going through John 14 through 16. Is it's Jesus Christ himself explaining how he was sent from the Father and how he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And so 
He's not just doing, you know what charades is, maybe some of you don't know what charades is. Maybe, have all you kids played charades? I don't know. Charades is a game where you don't get to say anything, but you have to act out so that they can guess the word or the phrase that you're trying to act out. And so um, God is not playing charades by just doing stuff. God is telling us and explaining what he's done and who he is. And so we want both. We want the show and the tell. That's what the gospel is. It shows who God is and, and shows his love, but it also tells and explains and invites. And so we think of God's eternal being, his mighty works, and then we also think of the Trinity in terms of rich relating. We're baptized into the name. I've already talked about that. The name the eternal name of the I Am is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We experience adoption and fellowship. The Bible says that God sent His Son, born of a woman, and then He sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. He sent us the spirit of adoption. And we have fellowship with the Son and with the Father through the Holy Spirit. God does not just rescue us and then say, okay, now you're free to just go do what you want again. He wants us to fellowship with him. He wants us to enjoy his love the same way the Son enjoys his love. Jesus, at the very end of John 17, as we're going to see, says he prays to his Father that the love the Father has for Jesus will be in his followers and that Christ himself will be in them. That's what the Bible means when it's talking about adoption and fellowship. So God shares his love with us. Not just that he reserves a little bit of his love for us and a whole bunch of his love for Jesus, but that the very same love that he has for Jesus is directed toward those who are in Jesus and united with Jesus. Again, remember, God is simple. God can't divide a little chunk of this or a little chunk of that. When he gives himself, he gives him his whole self. He gives the love that he has for his son when he gives us his spirit. He shares the life of his son and of his spirit. And that's why we live eternally. We're adopted as God's sons. We're not the eternally begotten sons like Jesus is, but by participation in Jesus, we get to be adopted as God's sons and we have his life in us. And it's a life that, well, it's eternal, so it can't die. He even shares his mind with us. He shares his mind with us in the scriptures, but he also shares his mind by giving us what the Bible calls the mind of the spirit or the mind of Christ. Adolf Seyfer, a writer from the late 1800s, asked um, if we've ever read the Bible in the original languages. He says, I'm not talking about whether you have ever read it in Greek or in Hebrew. Those are not the original languages of the Bible. The original language of the Bible is the love of God for his Son. And only when you know the love of God for his son and that love is speaking to your heart and you hear the voice of God speaking in the Bible, that it's not just something that you're studying and taking the words of, but that God is talking to you, then you're beginning to understand the original language of the Bible, the voice of God, the voice of love. And then you understand more and more what the mind of the Spirit and the mind of Christ mean. How do we relate to God? Well, part of it is um, prayer and praise. When we pray, we ought not to be people who ignore the Father and neglect the Holy Spirit. Some of us perhaps focus almost entirely on Jesus in our prayers, and it is certainly appropriate to pray to Jesus, though it's not the main pattern of the Bible. It's appropriate to pray to the Holy Spirit because he is divine or sing a song of praise to the Holy Spirit because he is divine, but there is no prayer to the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Not because he's not worthy of worship or can't be prayed to, but the normal pattern of prayer in the Bible is Trinitarian. You pray prompted by the Holy Spirit in the name or authority of Jesus and you pray to the Father. That is the normal grain or pattern or flow of prayer is to, to know that there's somebody in you stirring you to pray, and that's the Holy Spirit. And you know that you have the right to go to God because 
of Jesus, and you know that God is your father because he's the eternal father of Jesus and because he adopted you as his child. And that changes the way that we pray. If we pray along the flow of the Trinity, from the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father, then we start to realize what an amazing thing it is. Jesus taught us to pray our Father. You say, yeah, well, I've rattled that off a thousand times. Do you know what it means to say our Father? You're talking to God as though you are Jesus Christ. You're talking to God as though you are Jesus Christ. You're talking to God like you're his son. Whatever gave you the idea, you could do that. <laughs> well, only because his son made it possible for you to do that, to go to him and speak to God as though you're Jesus Christ because you're joined to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. You're united with Christ. And the more you learn to pray and to think in a Trinitarian way, in the Spirit, through Jesus Christ, to the Father, um, you'll get better theology along the way as, as you pray properly. But more important than that, uh, the good theology can help you pray in a more daring and meaningful way because you can talk to God as though you're his own son or his own daughter because you are. Jesus said so. C.S. Lewis, in the last part of Mere Christianity, has a chapter called Let's Pretend. And he says, it would be an outrageous bit of cheek, <laughs> you know, to go around pretending that you're the son of God, except that God tells you to do it, and he pretends that he's your father. And he doesn't, of course, just pretend. If he starts acting like your father, it's because he is. And as with children, you know, sometimes children play pretend games, and before you know it, they've grown into grown-ups who are what they were acting like. There's a bad way of pretending, which is just hypocrisy, but there's also a good way of pretending. Okay, I'm going to reckon that to be so. I'm going to reckon it so that God is my Father, that I am in Christ, that the Holy Spirit is working in me. Sometimes I only feel it very dimly, but I'm going to start acting and talking like that, and before you know it, it's more and more of a reality in your life. So you can pray, and, and when you praise, it's good to sing songs to Jesus, but the songs that we want to sing are going to be praising each person of the Trinity, sometimes by appropriations where we praise God the Father as our Creator, the Son as our Savior, the Holy Spirit as our indweller, sometimes just praising the whole Trinity. But again, in our praise, we do not want to be Father ignoring or Spirit neglecting. And even our very choice of songs that we love should reflect that. And then just a quick word about missions. I told you before, missions is the Latin word for getting sent. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. We're on a mission because his mission came. The Father sent the Son and the Spirit, so you know what mission is. It's not just being a do-gooder who's trying to improve the world a little bit or give some polite suggestions on better behavior, or try to start some kind of um, organization that makes the world better. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to make the world better in whatever little ways you can, but if you want to know what Christian mission is, it is the declaration, the proclamation that God has sent His Son into the world, and that you can have the Spirit of His Son living in your heart. And the church is wasting its time if it's going to try to do a whole bunch of other things in mission and neglect that. Because the only thing we really have to offer, and it's a really wonderful thing to offer, is God himself. If the church is not offering God, it should shut up and get out of business. We exist to glorify and praise God and to make him known and to make him truly known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory be to God the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We praise you, God, for revealing yourself, and we pray that more and more we may enter into a rich relationship with you. We pray, Father, that we may more and more know you as that loving Father who has eternally been Father, the giver of life and love to your own Son, and that we can be 
your sons, your daughters, by faith and union with Jesus. We thank you for the blessed Holy Spirit. May each day, Lord, we not grieve or quench your spirit, but live in the power of the Spirit and come to know you better and better. Lord, open our minds to the degree that we're able. Some of us, Lord, have greater intellects, some less. Some have more learning, some less. Uh, you know who we are and what our capacities are. Give us, Lord, each the capacity of understanding that you would have us to have, and then, Lord, to rejoice in whatever we do understand, to marvel and wonder at what we don't in adoring such a great and wondrous creator, and help us to keep growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.